like I said, I got a lot to go over. So let's get right into it. First and foremost, Muslims believe in the Qur'an as God's revelation and we believe that the Qur'an teaches Tawheed, monotheism. Muslims also believe that the past prophets of God, like Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus, yes, we believe that Jesus was a prophet of God, also received and delivered God's revelation. However, we do not consider uh, today's Bible as fully reliable. Thankfully, so much of the Bible still contains passages that we fully agree with, that fully agree with our Islamic theology. So today, in an attempt to bring us closer together, I hope to familiarize my Christian audience with the way Muslims understand Tawheed through the Bible itself. Let's keep going. First and foremost, we should keep in mind that God is the best teacher. Teacher. So let's keep in mind that if God is the best teacher, a good teacher knows that the most important ideas must be repeated the most. So let me be a good teacher and say that again. The most important ideas must be repeated the most. I hope that makes sense. So let's take a look. The oneness of God is repeated in the Bible so much. It is really hammered home, which is something that when Muslims take a first look into the Bible, they're amazed that Tawheed, the oneness of God, is repeated hundreds, maybe thousands of times throughout the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. There is no other. I myself am he. There is none besides me. And so on and so on and so forth. There's so many. And as you can see, there's a question at the bottom. If monotheism is repeated so often, why isn't the Trinity mentioned with the same clarity and the same frequency? This is really important because obviously God is a good teacher. He knows what to say and how to say it. Moving right along. Jesus himself, you might say, oh, that's all Old Testament. Don't worry about it. Jesus himself emphasizes and stresses the importance of monotheism. In fact, he does so to a Jewish audience, people who already believe in the oneness of God, and yet he still hammers that home. Let's take a look. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them really good answers. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? I want you guys to think about it. If you were to walk into church and say, what's the most important thing I need to know? I would assume it's some sort of formula of what? Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You have to ex accept him into your heart because he died for your sins and that he is one of a trinity or something along those lines. A pretty close formula, right? And yet, what do you find Jesus himself saying? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's speaking to a Jewish audience that already knows this, and yet he's doubling down. That is cru crucial. Furthermore, on, an, uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We all want to get to heaven, right? So does this guy. Seems like a good question. What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, to love your God with all of your heart and with your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. He is quoting Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He's quoting Leviticus and Deuteronomy as a Jew. And what is Jesus' response? He says, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Now again, not to be rude, but we have to think about this. Technically, from a Christian perspective, that's not enough. That's not enough. He did not include Sacrificial atonement. He did not include the Trinity. He did not include the things that actually get you into heaven from a Christian perspective. But as a Muslim, I'm loving this. And I'm just like, this is perfect. This is Islam right here. In fact, when he's praying to the Father, he specifies, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and that Jesus Christ is the one that you have sent. So this is the idea that there is one God and his messenger. In Arabic, La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulullah. Pretty nice stuff. And uh, in, you know, in the future after that, it's La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and that, uh, you know, the messenger of his time is his messenger. Let's keep going. Now I know as Christians, you're going to say, wait a second, uh, I disagree because Jesus makes multiple divinity claims. And case in point, I and the Father are one. John 10, 30, boom, slam dunk, clear as day, he is one, and therefore that's the Christian perspective means that it's literally one. However, us pesky Muslims, we have a different perspective. We uh, say that, no, this means one in terms of message and purpose and mission. So who's right? Who's got the best evidence? Let's keep reading. So we just quoted John 10, 30. Let's go to 31, all the way to 36. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. Because as you know, in Deuteronomy, it says, if somebody blasphemes, you stone the guy to death. So they're going to do it. And then what happens? But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good works, they replied. But because of blasphemy, you, a mere man, claim to be God. Boom, that's Christianity right there. Fully man, fully God. It seems that his opponents got it. I personally think his opponents got it because they're trying to misrepresent him. That's what opponents do. But anyway, regardless, it seems that Jesus clarifies. Wonderful. Jesus answered them, isn't it written that I have said you are gods? Uh, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside... What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son. You guys use this kind of language too. And you don't mean it in a literal way. This is exactly how you guys speak. So you are misrepresenting me. That's what it seems to be saying. Maybe 
I can have a clarification later, but that's what it seems to be saying. And if that's not satisfactory, then furthermore, when we take a look at the oneness of both Jesus and God, we see that it is likened to the oneness of the disciples. Take a look at John 17, uh, uh, 17 11, which specifies that Jesus is praying, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, the disciples, so that they may be one as we are one. Wait a second, are the disciples literally one person? No, of course not, but they are one in terms of message and purpose and mission. So if they're one in terms of message and purpose and mission, as we are one, as the Father and the Son are one, then perhaps they're one in terms of those things as well. Let's keep going. Are we good for divinity claim? Yes, we're good. Divinity claim number two. This is often used as slam dunk evidence. Which, which is it? Before Abraham was, ego a me, I am. Why is this so strong? Because the statement, I am, is from Exodus 3.14. The Christian perspective is that this statement is considered a divinity claim. Because this is what God calls himself. I am that I am. So, this in Hebrew is ho'on. Ho'on in Hebrew. However, this is a Greek text and it's saying ego a me. But does it mean I am that I am? Is it truly a uh, divinity claim. Let's take a look at the very next slide. Well, the Muslim perspective says no. We say, let's take a look at the next chapter. So we were talking about John chapter 8, verse 58, right? Okay, let's go to John chapter 9 and see how that sentence is used. After Jesus miraculously healed a blind man's eyes, that man went back home. What happened? His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't that the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he, wa uh, and some claimed that he was. Others said, no, 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 he, looks, he, lo he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, ego a me. Ladies and gentlemen, was this blind man standing up and saying, I am that I am, I am God? Nobody translates it that way. It just means, I'm the guy you're talking about, guys. I'm the one you're referencing. That's what it means. So, ego a me, here, then we have to now reverse, so that's uh, John, John chapter 9, now we've got to go back, I know it's a bit confusing, but now we've got to go back to John chapter 8 and understand it with that lens. Let's re-examine what Jesus was saying in chapter 8. He was describing himself slightly earlier as a person, as a man who received revelation. That's called prophethood, a man who receives revelation. Why do we know this? John 8, 40 says what? As, as it is, you're looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. He's saying, I am a prophet, I'm a man, and I received the word of God, and that's why you're trying to kill me. And then later on, they, he, you know, they have this discussion about this is something that Abraham rejoiced at when this prophet, when this Messiah would come. You're just a young man. How could you claim to be as old as the time of Abraham? And then he says, no, no, no. Abraham was a prophet. He prophesied. And he said, before even Abraham was, that's who I was. That's what we're talking about. I was indeed a prophet. Ego a me. Not a divinity claim. So Jesus first confirms that he is the awaited prophet. Then says that this was his destiny even before Abraham. John 8, 58, the verse in question. This isn't a divinity claim because all believers were in God's no eternal knowledge. As we know from Ephesians 1, 4, which says, For he, ch he chose us in him before the creation of the world. I hope that is all clear. Let's keep going. Next divinity claim, number three is what? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Boom, another slam dunk, right? You look at me, you're looking at the Father, seems like a clear divinity claim. The Christians say seeing Jesus is seeing God, literally, no question about it. However, the Islamic understanding is what? Seeing me means you're seeing my miracles, you're hearing my truth, you're seeing the evidence of God, and that gives you full conviction of God. Now you might say, is that really a strong interpretation? Well, it's the only interpretation we got. Why? Because if you take the literal method, then you run into contradictions. Why? Because earlier in John, John 5.37, it says, And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard the, his voice nor seen his form. Imagine that. Imagine if it's literal. That means Jesus is standing there. Everybody's looking at him, he's looking at them. And they're listening to his voice. And he's saying, you have never heard the Father's voice. You have never seen him. They're looking right at him. So clearly, you can't take that as literal. So the only way out of this, and the way you can hold on to this is what? Hold on to the Islamic perspective, and you're good to go. Let's keep going. Point number four, divinity claim number four. When Jesus saw their face, faith, excuse me, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. What is the Christian perspective here? Only God can forgive sins, therefore Jesus must be God. Seems like a pretty airtight concept, right? What's the Islamic perspective? Let's take a look. First and foremost, the passive voice is used instead of the active voice. He doesn't say, I forgive your sins. He says, your sins are forgiven. That is different. It's a reporting. You're reporting of something that happened. You're not saying, I forgave you. saying your sins are forgiven. That's pretty important. Point number two. 
If you keep reading, Jesus miraculously heals the paralytic man and then tells us why. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he's trying to demonstrate that this is an authority that was granted to me. It's not something intrinsic to me. This is something that was granted to me. Now, you might say, well, anybody who's granted the ability to forgive sins must be God. That's not true either, because even if God commissioned Jesus with the ability to forgive, that wouldn't make him divine, just as the disciples were commissioned to forgive people and they were not divine. Evidence is John 20, 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Those are the disciples, and they're not gods. Nobody worships them, so I hope that's clear. Let's keep going. Now, those are a number of Usual, common evidences that are used to establish the divinity of Jesus, but it gets even deeper, ladies and gentlemen. What does the Bible say about being God? And let's remember, when something is repeated over and over again, it's probably because God really wants to hammer this home so it's clear. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. So the Christian idea that he changed his mind and became a man this, in my opinion, is truly problematic. Why? Because that involves a lot of change. That means you're being born as a baby, you're growing up as a man, and then dying. These are all changes. And Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. And furthermore, it says, for I am God and not a man. And it also says, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent, 1 Samuel 15.29. Uh, 15, so, Again, why repeat over and over and over again, I'm God, not a man, I'm God, not a man, I'm God, not a man, I'm God, not a man. Four times to clarify this very important point. And the question is, from the Christian perspective, if Jesus isn't fully man and fully God, as the Christians say, then what is he? The Muslims, lo and behold, have this crazy idea that he's a prophet. Why? Because he calls himself a prophet. It's not that different or strange of an idea. From the Islamic perspective, it's very straightforward. Let's take a look at Matthew 13, 55 to 58. So Jesus comes to his hometown, what happens? They start criticizing him. Hey, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't, this the mother? isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And aren't all his sisters with us? And, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, where then did this man get these things? And they took offense at him. So he's getting kind of put down in his own hometown. So what does he respond? But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. Clearly saying, I should expect this, I'm a prophet, and that's what happens to prophets. So when a Muslim says, we believe Jesus is a prophet, just remember, he called himself a prophet. Hope that's clear. Let's keep going. Uh, did I get to the next one? Jesus a prophet? We did that one? Oh, did I not? Did I, did I do that one? Oh, I didn't do that one. Guys, let me know. <laughs> okay, that's the one right there for the prophet. Let's keep going. Uh, no problem. Next. The Bible describes the idea, even the concept of God being on earth, as absurd. It's an absurd idea. Why? So, because the prophet Jeremiah said in 1 Kings 8, 27, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. It's just an absurd concept. God is the author of time, matter, and space. Why would God somehow be subjected to specific dimensions and three-dimensional space and color and texture and temperature and, I don't know, friction and all these other factors? This is something that, yes, the, the Quran rejects, but, guys, even the Bible is saying, it's absurd. How could you be confined on earth? The, heaven, the highest heavens can't even contain you. So I hope that is clear as well. Let's keep going on. Jesus continuously differentiates himself. And for each one of these, I want you guys to remember that he differentiates himself from God and then doesn't follow up with, by the way, I didn't really mean it or anything like that. There's never like this follow-up that says, I, I meant the opposite or something like this. He just says these statements which seem to be quite straightforward. Let's take a look at them. Difference in terms of teaching. My teaching is not my own. How could God say that? If he's God, how could God say, my teachings are not my own? They are your own. There's, no, there's nobody else. You're God, right? You're one with the Father. Whose are they? So it comes from the one who sent me. This is clearly subordinationalist. This is, you're subordinated to uh, God. You're not one with God, and you're not equal to God, co-equal, and so forth. Different in terms of knowledge. How can you say he's one with the Father if he doesn't have the same knowledge as God? But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Different in terms of will. Not, yet not as I will, but as you will. This is a statement of saying, look, we don't have the same will. So how can we then just gloss over that and say, no, no, they're one and they have the same will. It seems uh, wrong to do so. Did I get to the next one? There you go. Good. Different in terms of nature. I like this one a lot because I've heard so many Christians use all kinds of analogies. Oh, the Trinity is like, you know, a, a vapor and liquid water and ice. It's H H2O, but they have different forms. Or it's like an egg that has a shell and the white and the yolk. Or uh, what's another one? I don't know. There's a bunch of them. You guys, uh, I think light is like a particle and it's a wave and it's a heat and light, etc. You guys, I'm, you guys are very familiar, right? 
So you hear these things and you think, hold on, guys. What was Jesus' analogy? He must have given an analogy, right? So I would assume that he's going to give an analogy if he's going to use anything that has to do with plants or trees. Maybe he'll say, like, God is like uh, the roots because you can't see it, but it's like the foundation. And then the trunk is Jesus because, you know, something that you can see, one. And then the fruits is like the Holy Spirit, you know. And then they're all one tree. That would work, sort of, right? I could imagine or something along those lines. And yet I read, I am the true vine. Okay. Here we go, and what are we going to, roots or fruit, or what's, what's coming next? And my father is the gardener. Guys, in my opinion, that's just not nice, you know? I, I mean, I can't be mad at God, but I can be sad. Like, why can't you say it clearly? If you want to say something, just say it. Say, say what you want to say. Why would you say something that gives the opposite impression? Different in terms of ability. Why would you say, by myself, I can do nothing? And earlier we were hearing about how he uh, walked on the water. Moses, the whole water split for him. Right? And he walked, that's, that's even, I mean, it's incredible, the idea of walking on the water. Imagine pushing the whole thing aside. Get out of here, water. I'm going to walk on the ground. I mean, now do we worship? No, of course not. Right? Because this is something that, as Jesus says, I can do nothing. And Moses, same thing. I can do nothing. So these things seem, should be taken in their context. And furthermore, the idea that uh, uh, he's the same as the Holy Spirit. Uh, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. And anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Okay, well then it doesn't seem that they are the same. Let's keep going on. Jesus equivocates himself with the disciples. This to me is just very, very strong evidence. Because when he says that I have to leave, I have to ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In my opinion, the only way you can hold on to this is if you take the Islamic approach. Why? Because he's equivocating. He is making this equality between himself and his disciples, saying, look, I'm a human, you're a human, we're all human beings. He's my Father, he's your Father, he's my God, he's your God. And this is confirming the idea that he's a man and a prophet. In order to maintain the Christian theology, you have to do, and I apologize, I don't mean to offend, but it's a type of mental gymnastics that I think is just too far. It's too much, because you're saying, okay, wait a second, he's saying, I'm going to my father. That's uniquely, literally, therefore I'm worthy of worship. In the same breath, your father, which is not unique, metaphorical, you're not worthy of worship. Then, in the same breath, my God, which is metaphorical, because he is me, God doesn't have a God. And then, your God, which is literal, because you guys literally are worshipers and, and, and the creation of God. This to me is just a stretch too far, and I much, I, I can only accept that this is clearly a prophet saying, listen, I'm a human, you're a human, yes, I've been given revelation, that makes me special, but we're all just human beings, he's my God, he's your God, he's my father, he's your father. Other than that, it's just too much, it's, 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 it's beyond the pale for me. Um, okay, I do have a few minutes, okay, I'm not too bad. Here we go, Jesus prayed in all four gospels, we don't have to read all four of them, but there are four Gospels here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them mentioning Jesus prayed. I don't have to read them because everybody knows that Jesus prayed over and over again. Look at the bottom. It says, there's a question here. Was Jesus sincerely praying to himself, right? Because I don't know what it means to pray to oneself, right? And usually the answer I get is, no, 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 he wasn't praying to himself. He was demonstrating. He was being a role model. He was showing us how to pray. Oh, you mean like going through the motions? And the response is, yeah, like going through the motions. You mean like faking it? And they say, whoa, 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 he wasn't faking it. So now you're kind of stuck between two bad spots. But the good thing is there is a way out. You accept the slam, and then it's like, look at that. Look how easy that is. Just like all the prophets that prayed, he prayed too. Oh, man, that was simple, right? But if not, if you say that he was faking it, then they have an insincere prayer of Jesus. That's uncomfortable. And if you say, no, no, he was sincere, that means he was sincerely praying to himself. That doesn't work either. So we're kind of stuck between two spots. Here we go. Let's keep going. They're not going to read all this. Don't worry. I just want to say that you might say, sometimes Christians say, but Jesus is God because he's the son. So here's a long list of all the different. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the little hands up. Thank you. Here's a long list that nobody has to read, but you, I mean, there's little quotations. You can see them. There's a lot of sons of God in the Bible. All throughout the Bible, there's lots and lots of sons of God. Adam is a son of God. David is a son of God. I believe Jacob is a son of God, etc. There's a lot. That's just a one list, but there's more and more and more. So sometimes the Christian says, you have to understand, he's the son. I'm sorry, that's not going to cut it. Yes. And also they might say that, oh, he's the Messiah. That's also not going to cut it because Messiah or Mashiach or Christos or Christ or the anointed one, there's lots of them. Uh, priests, prophets, kings, even Cyrus, who was a non-believer, it says this is what the Lord says to his anointed. Even a non-believer, non excuse me, <laughs> a non-believer was considered an anointed one. So he's a Christ. That means he's a Mashiach. It doesn't work. And final point is, oh, I have 30 seconds left. God can do anything. That's what I often hear. Well, yes, God can do anything, and that's how it makes sense. Well, my response to that is the Muslim perspective is, God has power over all, all coherent things, not things that are incoherent. What do I mean? Imagine the following di dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, with 19 seconds left. Somebody prays to God, God, can you make me a blah, blah, blah? 
No. Oh, you can't do something? You're weak? No. Uh, it's not that I'm weak. Uh, the answer is no, not because of any weakness of mine, but because of your failure to communicate a coherent request. Same thing as, dear God, can you make me a square circle, a married bachelor, or a liftable, unliftable rock? You know, is, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift? You guys know the thing. Okay, I'll finish that up later. Thank you. Thank you.